Welcome back to the State of the Nation. Today, joining us from his parliamentary office in Cape Town is the leader of the Freedom Front Plus, Dr. Peter Grunewald. Dr. Grunewald, welcome. Welcome to the State of the Nation. Thank you, Mike, and uh, thank you for the opportunity. Now, uh, you recently, um, we had the EFF's 10th anniversary birthday bash, which was quite a bash, one has to say. Fireworks, dances, men on raised platforms, all sorts of things was, was happening, quite a spectacle. Uh, and then, of course, uh, you know, looking for a bit of publicity, there was also the controversial singing of the Kill the Boer song. And uh, you have uh, re reacted strongly to that. Tell us about it. Well, firstly, I want to start by saying that uh, the slogan, Kill the Boer, Kill the Farmer, or the song, the Freedom Front Plus uh, uh, took that matter to the Human Rights Commission already in 2003. And the Human Rights uh, Commission then declared the song as hate speech. Now, after that, there were some other cases. Uh, and in the end, uh, it's about last year, there was another incident where Julius Malema chanted uh, this uh, slogan. And Afri Furum took him to, uh, well, actually to court. Uh, that is the Equality Court. But in August last year, what then happened is, quite surprisingly, the Equality Court made a finding that it is not hate speech. So technically, on a legal basis, the song is not hate speech. But what happened, as you said, what the bash, uh, he added some words. He uh, chanted, uh, kill the bird, kill the farmer, and then he said, shoot to kill. And that makes a difference. And what I did is on Monday, I then laid a charge in terms of the Riotous Act that stipulates quite clearly that you are not allowed to instigate violence. So that is the criminal charge at this moment against Julius Malema. Now, Dr. Grunewald, uh, you know, in South Africa, um, Julius Malema shot the rifle on stage. It's caught on camera. Everybody can see. We all know the things. Um, nobody investigated or certainly nothing came of it. You got a situation where gunmen come into the the the, the house of a prominent, uh, you know, Bafana Bafana put football captain and shoot him in front of 10 witnesses and nothing happens. Is this not just politicking? Are you not just doing exactly what Julius Malema wants to do? Because there's absolutely no way that a captured body, like say the Human Rights Commission or the police force for that matter, is going to do anything about it, surely? Well, we must do something. And uh, you're quite correct. Uh, I said that numerous times that the problem in South Africa when it comes to crime, and uh, there's no doubt about it, uh, the criminal justice system is failing South Africans. And yes, uh, I mean, we also saw with uh, this birthday celebrations uh, and anniversary that the deputy uh, head of uh, criminal of, uh, intelligence of the police services was a guest. And he actually sat uh, with uh, Mazotti there uh, that is well known for smuggling and uh, therefore you can ask questions about whether something will happen. Well, we're going to keep the pressure on them. And we also, I also want to say that in terms of firing a firearm in public, those cases are still ongoing. Uh, but if you look for instance, what is happening with uh, Zuma using each and every way to not appear in the courts, uh, of course, they will also do it, and that's why we will also continue with laying charges, follow up the processes. I am a member of the Portfolio Committee of Police in Parliament, and I will still ask the questions there. I will also ask the questions in Parliament, keeping the pressure on them, because unfortunately, there is now a process. We lay the charge. The police must now investigate. They must compile a docket. And uh, 
after they've compiled the docket, then they have uh, to give it to the National Prosecuting Authority, and then they can make a decision whether they want to prosecute or not. If they're not going to prosecute, then of course we can start a civil or a private, uh, can I say, prosecution. But it is unfortunately a, pro a, a process taking time, uh, but we will keep on doing exactly that to ensure that we keep the pressure on Julius Malema. Maybe I can just also say to our uh, viewers that when they registered as a political party, it was around about 2013, just before the 2014 election, I, on behalf of the party then, I was not the leader then, but then I uh, compiled a complaint in terms of uh, the constitution with the electoral commission, and it said that it is against certain uh, rules, uh, it is instigating and it can create the perception uh, that they're going to instigate violence and everything, not on this song, but on the constitution, but it was rejected. Uh, even the electoral court, uh, it was rejected. So they decided, uh, the electoral commission, that uh, they are legally within uh, the parameters of the constitution of South Africa to be registered as a political party. And I'm saying this because many people are asking the question, Bob, why don't you apply to de-register them? Uh, unfortunately, they're on, just on the line uh, as far as that is concerned. And, and also, there, there, there's obviously complicity. We, we know that uh, the EFF are in coalition with the ANC in many of the metros, uh, certainly in Gauteng, and they're looking, uh, you know, much of the talk is that they're going to be coalition partners following the election, where the ANC looks set to be below 50%, and the question is just how far. But the gap can probably be made up with the EFF, by the EFF. So you probably have the government slow playing this as well, I'd imagine. It's not impossible. We can talk about the possibility of a coalition between the ANC and the EFF, I don't think it is uh, just uh, a fact that that will happen. Uh, I'm not so sure about that, because what I observe in Parliament and uh, through history with the ANC, uh, when Cyril Ramaphosa became the president, uh, like I always say, there's uh, very bad blood between Ramaphosa and Julius Malema. And we saw in the media now that even on a national level, the ANC took a decision and actually uh, said to Gauteng a provincial uh, legislature and the members of the ANC on uh, that uh, level that uh, they were, must withdraw uh, any uh, type of uh, coalition with the EFF. Uh, people think it will happen, uh, but to give you one example, you know, we had a long process on the amendment of uh, Section 25 of the Constitution because the ANC wanted expropriation without compensation. For that, they had to amend Section 25. And everybody thought that the EFF will support them. And in Parliament, the EFF did not support them. Uh, and uh, so I'm not so sure that that will be uh, the, can I say, the position. Say, for instance, the ANC gets between, say, 45 and 48 uh, percent. I think they will go to other smaller parties. I think that they will approach the Democratic Alliance even. And uh, with great respect, there is a strong possibility that, for instance, if the opposition parties together cannot have a majority, that the DA will be willing to go into a coalition with the ANC. And they said it uh, at different uh, places already, yeah, yeah. and it had been reported. So, and after, well, say for instance, uh, if the DA doesn't want to, they can go to some other smaller parties, like the, for instance, it depends who's going to be elected because they're only going to need a few members then. Uh, but, I am on record, and it will always be the record, that the Freedom Front Plus will never go into any coalition with the ANC or with the EFF. Yeah, however, it must be stated, and we must be remembered, that your predecessor actually served in the ANC government, didn't he, as a 
Deputy Minister of Agriculture. Yes, that's true. But he was not a member of the cabinet. Uh, we must just distinguish that. So he was not part of the cabinet and the government as such. He was a deputy minister, that's true. And the reason why we accepted that position for him is that the agricultural unions, we consulted with them and other civil organizations, and they said that they will blame us if he doesn't take up that position. And that's why he took it up to see whether he can make a difference. And we said, well, the fact that he's not part of cabinet, but it, it can be a voice to the executive, uh, he took up that position. So I uh, want to say that we were not part of the government as such. They were not a coalition because in a coalition, if you vote in parliament, you vote with your coalition partners. And the Freedom Front Plus, although he was a deputy uh, minister, we always said that we will still vote. If we feel against any legislation or anything like that, we will oppose uh, the ANC. And we did that, exactly that. So it was not a coalition partner being a deputy minister and we vote uh, and support the ANC in the National Assembly. We didn't do that. Okay, well, before we get on to the coalitions that uh, that that um, is currently in discussion on the opposition ben benches, I just want to uh, just circle back a little bit to the EFF and uh, their potential coalition uh, with the ANC, which you say we're getting mixed signals. There's no doubt about it. You know, the, the talk is, and uh, I certainly, as far as I can make out, it seems like there's definitely a, a pact between Paul Mashatile and Julius Malema um, and then there's some unhappiness from some of the other side of the uh, of the ANC divide, which there clearly is. And I want to draw your attention to one of the things, and you you obviously uh, took uh, about as much interest in this as I did when I when I heard it said, and that was when Julius was addressing his guests at his very expensive banquet the the, the day before the the night before the celebration party. He got up there and uh, he said something which I found, you know, unbelievably strange. Where he, he threatened his own party to say nobody better challenge him because he knows everything. It was quite a threatening pose and quite a threatening statement to make. Now, certainly, my mind immediately led me to the place where, as you say, there's a lot of people in the in ANC that are not fond of Julius Malema or his style, but maybe would be happy to work with the rest of the EFF if they got rid of Julius Malema. Do you think that's the case? Well, we must remember, I always say in politics, uh, you must never say never. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, yes, uh, there's always a possibility, make no mistake. There's always a, a possibility. But if the way I read it at the moment, I don't think it is the strongest possibility uh, for our coalition with the EFF. Uh, if you ask uh, me, my, what do I think is the strongest possibility? I think the strongest possibility is that uh, Cyril Ramaphosa, also depending on the percentage I get, will go for a government of national unity, uh, what, like what they did in uh, 1994. And the argument for that is you will use different political parties to uh, form a government of national unity. And then he can say to his uh, own members within the ANC, no, we're not in a coalition. We're in a government of national unity. And why I say that is I see the signs because uh, with the State of the Nation address uh, starting this year, he started and he said, we must all take hands. We must be co-responsible. We must ensure that we say to each other, we are all responsible for what's happening in South Africa and what is going to happen in the future. Well, I said to him, well, I'm not taking responsibility for his failures. Uh, yes, I want to build South Africa, but uh, I don't take that responsibility. So that type of language is uh, typically a government of national unity, which can, it's possible, that one position can be given to a EFF member of parliament. It's quite possible. But as you said, uh, 
on uh, what Julius said that no one must dare challenging him. Why did he say that? You only a leader only say that when there is a threat within his party. So there's no doubt. And earlier this year, uh, I know that there were members in the Eastern Cape who also challenged him and other people. Okay, they were they are not members of the EFF at the moment. So that is a problem for Julius Malema. And as you said, that uh, it I don't think. Well, let me put it this way: uh, I can't foresee that they will get rid of Julius Malema now. Uh, and the reason is any political party who's getting rid of the leaders at this moment, coming the 2024 election, uh, will be making a big mistake uh, because then you have to build uh, some new image on the leader of your political party. And uh, I don't think there's enough time for that. Yeah, on the other hand, you can't help thinking, you know, what Julius Malema, I think he's 40 or 41 or somewhere around there. If you're Floyd Shavambu, you've got 50 years to look forward to as being, uh, you know, deputy president of the EFF. It must start looking quite attractive to, to do a deal, uh, you know, or else you stay permanent deputy forever because there's no way uh, while, uh, you know, while we're on this planet that uh, Julius is ever going to surrender control of the EFF. He's quite clearly not a Democrat. We, we, we see that. Exactly. So, uh, and, and, sorry, you're quite right. And I mean, I always say politicians have aspirations. Sure. Uh, that's politics. And the, your analysis is quite correct. Uh, Floyd uh, Shivambu, and I saw him here in Parliament uh, a couple of times, uh, and you almost always look at the body language and uh, it's quite interesting to see that. And I think yeah. you're quite correct. His aspirations is actually, you had your chance, uh, Julius Malema, maybe it's my chance now. Yeah. And of course, we've seen uh, the sidelining of uh, the ice boy, um, boy Seni and Glozi, who was uh, up until uh, recently quite a prominent member of the leadership of three suddenly being relegated to... Uh, literally fetching ice. He doesn't seem to have any, he was everywhere all over the media and suddenly he is nowhere to be found. So one would imagine that he's been silenced completely. But enough about the EFF. I think we all understand what we're dealing with. We're dealing with a 10% party that's getting whacked in every by-election. I recently had uh, Prince Michele here and we were discussing the EFF and he made a good point. I was like, how does how does one uh, evaluate their poor performances in by-elections? And he said uh, he made a good point, being that by-elections is quite localized. It depends on the people who are running. And when you can't put uh, the glorious leader's face to a campaign, they're going to struggle. Do you uh, agree with that? I agree fully with that. Um, and uh, we must also remember that the style of Julius Malema it's a sort of a dictator style he's using in his party because he also said, and they've even publicized the more than 400 names of uh, office bearers of the, uh, the officials from the EFF that did not comply to ensure, I think the number was at least a thousand uh, members to, to the bash. And uh, well, we see you. We will see what is going to happen with them. So with that style, you're quite correct uh, that uh, I don't think uh, that you in the end will survive with that sort of uh, approach. Yeah, well, if you're going to use that approach, just sort of uh, certainly as I've studied uh, political history, if you're going to be a strong man, you better be a strong man. You actually literally have to take those people out back and shoot them. And that's what famously uh, Saddam Hussein did when he took over in Iraq as this democratic alternative. He in the hall, and it's a most uh, impelling, compelling video that anybody had ever watched. I'd please go and watch it, where he calls out the names of his party of people that he felt were conspiring against them and literally has them shot in the room. And from that moment on, surprisingly, he didn't have a, a lot of other um, uh, you know, people challenging him. So... Certainly, if you're going to play strongman politics, you've got to be very strong. We saw uh, Robert Mugabe throughout the 1980s. Everyone who challenged him ended up having a car accident. Uh, you really have to do that kind of thing. But I think just to sh challenge people, but then keep them around, 
you're just racking up uh, enemies if you want proof of that just look at what Cyril, what happened with Cyril Ramaphosa he kept those enemies around and that didn't work that well for him that's certainly what what I've uh, detected but let's talk now about uh, some of the things that one of the, the, the stories that was very popular and we even did a live event uh, with many of the participants and that is the uh, coalition talks between the opposition parties right we I'm, I don't want to mention that ridiculous name and give it any more air hopefully that gets changed we do know that pretty soon in the month of august there's going to be discussions with uh, yourselves uh, the democratic alliance action sa ifp and a few others to discuss the potential signing of an agreement that will happen before the the the, the next election so voters would know where they stand is that still on track is uh, the the talk still going to happen yes uh, it is still on track uh, in fact uh, we have a rather well every thursday evening we have a meeting and uh, yes the, the convention is the 16th and 17th of august two weeks more or less from now so it is on track uh, there was uh, a media release that the chair will be Professor Kumedi uh, for the convention. Uh, he's a uh, well-known academic. And We've he's had quite him on the show. Yeah, well, then you know. So I don't have to explain. So uh, he agreed uh, to be the chair of uh, the convention. And as you said, yes, there are certain matters that we will have to deal with. And... I just want to say the approach from the Freedom Front Plus is that, yes, we must sign an agreement. And to put it in simple terms, in that agreement, the political parties must agree that after the election, if we have the majority as opposition, that they will not join the ANC or any other political party in a coalition. And the reason I say that is that the voters of South Africa, uh, they must know which political parties will be willing to be part of an opposition coalition government, if I can put it that way. And you must remember, and I always say that coalition in South Africa is something new. We are all going through a learning curve. And if I say we, I say that includes the electorate as well as the politicians. And if I can come to the politicians, yes, they all have egos and all that sort of things. And they must adapt and understand that you cannot be a political party in a leader in a coalition and only want everything to happen favorably for your political party. I always say that you need strong leaders in coalitions a political party leader that can say, listen, yes, my first priority is my party, but we have to ensure that now we must look at issues which is in the best interest of the electorate. Uh, and that's not always uh, that simple. Uh, they all will tell you, yes, uh, we act in the best interest of the electorate. But when it comes to coalition government, uh, they must compromise. And the question is, uh, in what sense uh, and what degrees, if I can put it that way, more or less, are they willing to compromise? That's the most important. When it comes to the electorate, I mean, uh, the moment a year you're in a coalition, and that's, I am conf confronted with that, they say, well, you're now in this coalition, so why must I vote for your party? Because you all have all the same uh objectives you have all uh, the same policy now so i can uh, vote for any party of the coalition but the electorate must also understand that they can still vote for their political party for that party's principles and uh, whatever they need and think is part of that party that actually is suitable for them to vote for that party uh, and the policies but your vote still counts against uh, the ANC as the government. So the electorate must understand that. 
and you said you don't even want to mention the name. I am very firm on that, that we uh, cannot use that because if you use that, uh, I see with great respect and I'm not in a fight with the uh, uh, Democratic Alliance, uh, they already actually made the name, the brand name of their campaign. And uh, therefore we will have to talk about that. And we are talking about that. And I can say that we are moving away from the name, uh, but it will be finalized with uh, the convention. Okay, so everything's still on track. None of the partners are being shaken out because uh, obviously there's a there's a lot of ground to make up. There's, uh, you know, we we saw on stage in Johannesburg uh, a few weeks ago that uh, there, there's some talks that need to happen. Uh, there's some people that are missing each other. There were some people that got up that uh, still have some serious axes to grind, largely with the DA. Do you think uh, people will be able to put that uh, pettiness behind them and move forward in the interest of the country? I hope so. Uh, but uh, no, to say this is, I think the reality uh, in the end uh, will ensure that they will have no choice. They will be confronted with that. And if we get the situation where the opposition parties uh, have 50% plus one or more than 50%, and you can oust the ANC government, and those parties don't go along with that. I can assure you, in 2026, we have a local government election, and then, of course, the next election will be 2029. The electorate will deal with those political parties. So mm -hmm. the realities uh, will, in fact, force those political parties to put their small differences and personal differences aside. And mm -hmm. I am positive on that, and I can already see it, and I don't think I must mention certain items here, but uh, there were certain matters or issues uh, that some of the parties felt very strong, and uh, we already solved some of those uh, issues, and in the solving of those issues, I uh, can say that there was compromises and those petty things uh, were set aside uh, in, uh, in, in favor of what is in the best interest of the electorate. Well, let's hold thumbs, but uh, let's talk about numbers for a second. Uh, Dr. Krenewald, we, uh, I, I think at the moment, if one looks at the hard numbers, you, you probably have about one third of the votes, somewhere in the mid 30s, if you look at what has been polled uh, in the past. Uh, obviously, one must uh, must come in, take into account, which not a lot of uh, commentators are taking into account, is that that includes almost nothing from uh, Action SA that seems to have become a player without really standing in an election. I know they stood in six uh, areas around the country in the last municipal elections. I've done a lot of work and have gained quite a high profile. So one can add a little bit of uh, a couple of percent from them. But uh, the, the alliance, the opposition alliance looks well short of the mark. Um, where do you think the opposition, if everything goes right, uh, can make up that shortfall? They can make up that shortfall uh, to, from the voters not registered and not voted in previous elections. If you go and look at the numbers, as you said, at the moment, the ANC has got a 58% majority in the National Assembly, but they only have the support of 27% of eligible voters. If you go and look at the 21 local government elections, they only got about 12% of eligible voters. So, the secret for the next election is those eligible voters not registered and not going to vote. And that is the challenge all the political parties or the coalition partners will ensure that they start a very strong campaign and to ensure that the eligible voters register and that they go and vote. Uh, People, unfortunately, and that's part of the uh, what I said, the learning curve we must go through. 
people don't understand the proportional electoral system. And if I may, to put it in very simple terms, I always say that if we have 10 people who voted, six voted for the ANC, uh, one for party A, one for B, one for C, and one for D, the proportional electoral system then determines that the ANC has got six out of 10, that's 60%. So they get 60% of the 400 seats in National Assembly. Party A, B, C, and D uh, each had uh, one out of 10, that's 10%. So you get 10% of the 400 uh, members in Parliament in National Assembly. But now, if a voter did not go and vote, say for instance, that voter would have voted for Party D, what happens now? Now the ANC gets six out of nine, and six out of nine is 66%. So the moment opposition voters stay away, they're making the ANC stronger. They, some of them uh, think they are punishing the ANC. They're making them stronger uh, without the ANC getting one extra vote. So the people must understand, understand the uh, electoral system. So that will, as far as I'm concerned, be the biggest challenge to ensure that we get those people to vote. And we saw, in the, specifically in, in, in the 2021 election, about 3 million voters who traditionally voted for the ANC just stayed away. Now, it works the other way around. If the voters of the ANC, uh, if they don't go and vote, of course, that makes the opposition party stronger. So that is the numbers game, if I can uh, put it that way. So that is the, the challenge. Yeah, and uh, it's certainly something that uh, we've been saying uh, relentlessly on this particular platform is the importance of every vote for anyone. Vote for any party that uh, you feel could do the best job for, for the country. Uh, and you got to go. I've made the point continuously that, in my opinion, and I'd love to hear your thought on it, the 2024 election, in my opinion, is the most important election in the history of South Africa. Finished. Not going to say new South Africa. Any South It is the most important election ever because 1994 was largely symbolic. We were entering a new era. There was a lot of goodwill. We had the Nelson Mandela factor. We had a government of national unity looming. The election was very important symbolically. Politically, it didn't yield much because the new country was still finding its feet. And, uh, you know, one could be excused to say that was more of a, of a symbolic, uh, that first term, uh, term of government. Things only really started to get exciting politically after that. And, uh, you know, this one, there's going to be some change. There is no doubt about it. It looks absolutely certain that... Uh, that the ANC, if they don't, is going to struggle to get a majority. Let's just leave it there. And that has enormous implications. Please explain to the people watching today, what are the implications of, let's just say, the ANC getting 50% plus one at the next election. Let's just say they, they managed to keep the lights on for more than five minutes. Uh, they managed to muzzle for Kila and Balula, and they get 50% plus one. What is the actual implication as far as your work goes in Parliament and uh, in the provinces, we know what it what happens already at local government. What do you think will be the impact of that? Well, firstly, I quite agree with you. Uh, we are really at the crossroads in uh, 2024, and it is as far as uh, as or as you have said, the most important election. I uh, I completely agree with you, and the reason I say that is that that will determine the direction of, can I say, the future of South Africa. And that's what you said. Uh, if we, for instance, get, uh, or the ANC gets 50% plus one, they will still continue with what they are busy doing now, and that is to destroy South Africa. And let me just take one uh, uh, issue, for instance, uh, unemployment. Uh, at this moment, according to statistics, 48% of the population of South Africa is actually dependent on some or other social grant. But you only have about, say, 5 to 
six million uh, individuals paying tax. Now, it's not sustainable to think, let's make it six million. Six million cannot forever ensure and see to the welfare of, say, 60 million people. It's not just sustainable. Therefore, that will be more challenges for the future. I want to say, if it happens, and you've asked uh, my position or the Freedom Front Plus's position, we will continue. Because if they get, for instance, 52%, then they will have some trouble in Parliament to, for instance, ensure that certain legislation be accepted. And the reason I say that is that when there is voting in uh, Parliament, the ministers, many of them, they just, they are not present in Parliament for voting. And if they have a very, very small majority, then there's going to be trouble for them. They will not easily uh, can change certain legislation uh, in the working of a parliament, uh, because I mean, they've got about 38 ministers, you must remember, uh, well, ministers and deputy ministers, uh, that uh, they are members of parliament. Uh, they have to be members of parliament. So they must be there to vote. So I see, uh, as far as that is concerned, it's not the end of the world. Uh, I also always believe in this always hope, and that is that then, if they get a very small majority, then the opposition parties must be more vigorous. They must put more pressure on the government of the day, especially when it comes to the operational and the working of parliament. And uh, therefore, it will be sort of, uh, can I say, a way to uh, let they check their step, that is possible. Uh, but if we work hard, the best for South Africa is to ensure that we get a opposition, the correct partners in the uh, a opposition coalition to start a new, uh, can I say, direction in South Africa. And uh, we must, as we always say, the first thing we must do is to stop the decay in South Africa. Stop that, and then you start working for the future. It's not going to be uh, very easy to do that. Uh, there's no quick fix uh, if we look at the situation in South Africa. It will take time. But I am of the opinion the moment the voters, the electorate, if they see that there are changes with a new government, the support will grow and grow uh, for the 26 elections uh, as well as the 29 elections. So I always have hope, uh, ask, uh, answering your question for what will happen then. Well, uh, Dr. Grunewald, I want to end off by saying two things. Uh, we've made this point so many times in, in this short interview, and that is to anybody who's watching Please understand the, the importance of every vote. Go and tell your friends, go tell your family. Everybody must vote in the next election. It is so important. And then I'd like to say if there's anybody who is watching this from the ANC or the EFF, we would love to interview anybody from those parties, but they don't seem to have the courage to sit down and have an interview. So that would be great. But uh, Dr. Peter Grunewald, you've been very generous with your time. To everybody that's watched us, thank you so much. If you watch this long, you must subscribe to the channel, State of the Nation. And uh, Dr. Peter Grunewald, thank you so much for joy sharing your time with us today. Mark, thank you. And I say again, uh, you're always welcome. And thank you for the opportunity. And you're quite right. Uh, a change can actually only come from the electorate. Uh, the politicians are elected by the electorate. And the strongest change must come from the electorate and we must take hands to ensure that we change, get the new government and save South Africa. Well, and uh, just uh, in front of all these people, because then you have to say yes, is that uh, we're going to be doing a second leg of our breakfast session down in Cape Town after your talks. 
And uh, we hope that you'll be with us and we'll have the leaders of the other members of the coalition there just so that we can better understand what is happening, uh, what, what came out of those talks, and uh, hopefully we can give people more reasons to vote. Thank you so much, Dr. Peter Grunewald. Thank you to everybody that's joined us today. We'll see you the next time on The State of the Nation.